Greetings, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here in this historic moment in time. I am uh, blessed and honored to call to order this public hearing for Allegheny County of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, again, I thank you all for being here, and I hope you all are prepared uh, to participate in this process uh, because it will certainly involve you. Uh, this is an unforgettable experience at a perfect moment in time to see how legislature can turn into action. Um, and we are going to do our part to make sure that this legislation turns into the action that is necessary. At this time, I recognize Madam Assistant Attorney General Kristen McFarland, who will cite the specific state statute that requires the hearing. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen McFarland. I'm an Assistant Attorney General for the State of Maryland. The legislation that established the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission is House Bill 307. It was passed unanimously by the Maryland General Assembly in 2019. It provides as follows. For the purpose of establishing a Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, providing for the composition, chair, and staffing of the commission, authorizing the staff member to provide, authorizing the staff member provided by the Office of the Attorney General to issue certain subpoenas, prohibiting a member of the commission from receiving certain compensation, but authorizing the reimbursement of certain expenses, requiring the commission to hold certain public meetings, receive certain recommendations and make certain recommendations, authorizing the commission to research certain cases of racially motivated lynching, requiring the commission to submit an interim report and a final report to the governor and the general assembly on or before certain dates, providing for the termination of this act and generally relating to the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Whereas lynching or the extra legal murder of an individual in an act of mob violence is a violation of the rights to due process and equal protection of the law. And whereas at least 40 African-Americans were lynched by white mobs in Maryland between 1854 and 1933. And whereas no person was ever tried, convicted or otherwise brought to justice for participating in these racially motivated lynchings. And whereas various state, county and local government entities colluded in the commission of these crimes and conspired to conceal the identities of the parties involved. And whereas these crimes far exceeded any notion of justice, just retribution or just punishment, but were intended to terrorize African-American communities and force them into silence and subservience to the ideology of white supremacy. And whereas no victim's family or community ever received a formal apology or compensation from state, county or local government entities for the violent loss of their community members. And whereas restorative justice requires a full knowledge, understanding and acceptance of the truth before there can be any meaningful reconciliation. The commissioners consist of representatives from the Maryland Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Maryland Cultural Organizations and Museums, the Maryland State Archives and four public members appointed by the governor. The statute further provides that the commission shall hold regional hearings open to the public in areas in which a lynching of an African-American by a white mob has been documented, received from the public, including those from the families and communities affected by racially motivated lynchings, recommendations for addressing, engaging, and reconciling communities affected by racially motivated lynchings, including the erection of memorial plaques or signage at or near the sites of racially motivated lynchings and make recommendations for addressing the legacy of lynching that are rooted in the spirit of restorative justice. In the hearings conducted pursuant to this statute, the commission may research cases of racially motivated lynchings for which there is no documentation should those cases be brought to the commission's attention and the involvement of state, county and local government entities and relevant news media in cases of racially motivated lynching. On September 21st, 2020, the commission submitted an interim report of its findings and recommendations to the governor. On or before December 1st, 2023, the commission shall submit a final report of its findings and recommendations to the governor. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for your, your diligence. 
Uh, before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge another commissioner, Commissioner David Armenti. Uh, David, thank you as always uh, for your commitment to our work. Uh, at this time, I will explain our code of conduct uh, for today's hearing, our session, and present uh, today's agenda, and will also explain the process for testimonies and public comments. Members of the public had opportunity to submit testimony via email at, to mltrc at maryland.gov prior to today's hearing. During the hearing, questions and comments from members of the public should be submitted via the Zoom chat function. Uh, when you do provide your question or comment, please provide your name and organizational affiliation, if any, and please limit your comment or question to no more than three sentences. Questions and comments, as well as live testimony, must be limited to the topic of discussion for today's session. If your comment or question is off topic, it will not be included in the hearing or your live testimony will end. Comments, questions, and testimony should be presented with decorum and the respect appropriate for conducting this public hearing. Any comments or questions containing obscene language or language inciting imminent violence will not be addressed and any live testimony containing such language will end. Finally, please note that members of the media may be present during today's hearing, and as such, public comments, questions, and testimony may be broadcast or printed by news outlets. So let us reiterate, please keep, uh, keep this moment as respectful as it deserves and operate accordingly. All right. At this time, I would like to uh, recognize Vice Chair Chavis, who will facilitate the first phase of the hearing specifically concerning the history surrounding racial terror lynching in Allegheny County. Thank you, Commissioner um, Chair Van Kunle. At this time, I'd like to recognize Ms. Heidi Gardner of the Allegheny County Lynching, Truth, and Reconciliation Committee, um, who will present the history concerning the life and death of Robert Hughes, aka, excuse me, William Burns, aka Robert Hughes. Ms. Gardner provided key research and is here to share the research and methodology she used and how we, real, how we realized um, William Burns was Robert Hughes. She will, she'll also share the details of, of the lynching that took place um, in 1930. My name is Heidi Gardner and I am a genealogist, historian and librarian. In June of 2020, I offered to do research finding additional details on the lynching for the Brownsville Project and the Allegheny County Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee, which I subsequently joined. Within a couple months research, we had enough details to make what sense could be made of a senseless racial violence and were able to locate the Hughes family descendants. Before I talk more about the research methodology and discovery of William Burns identity, I'm going to read you an expanded summary of the lynching the committee has used this year to brief the public on the lynching of Robert Hughes and the events of October 1907. Shortly after midnight on Sunday, October 6, 1907, a large white mob lynched an 18 year old African American man known as William Burns in Cumberland, Maryland. After being involved in an altercation with a local white police officer on October 3, 1907, that resulted in the police officer's death, Mr. Burns was arrested, driven to the local police headquarters, and held in a cell. The next morning, he was transported to the Allegheny County Jail, also in Cumberland. While he awaited trial, a mob entered the jail, abducted Mr. Burns, and beat and shot him to death. Although several local officials were present, no one would identify members of the mob, and no one was ever held accountable for the lynching of William Burns, Robert Hughes. Originally from Fauquier County, Virginia, Mr. Burns relocated to Allegheny County and had been living there for seven months prior to October 1907. Before his death, Mr. Burns was employed as a porter at Alpine Hall, at that time a hotel in Cumberland, and as a driver for a black man named George Palmore, who with his wife, Mary, operated a local saloon and restaurant. After work on Thursday, October 3rd, Mr. Burns and another local man, black man named Jesse Page, visited a couple of local saloons near the Canal Wharf in Cumberland. While at the second saloon, known as Cape Preston's, Mr. Burns was accused of disorderly conduct and thrown out. Shortly thereafter, August Baker, a local white police officer on the Cumberland Police Force, arrived on the scene to arrest Mr. Burns. 
Before the officer could take him into custody, a struggle ensued, wherein Officer Baker struck Mr. Barnes with a mace, and reports stated that during the struggle, Officer Baker was shot in the abdomen by Mr. Burns, but was still able to handcuff Mr. Burns. After calling for assistance, the officer had a black ice wagon driver named Humphrey Green and another witness, bartender Abram Speck, transport Mr. Burns by cab to the Cumberland Police Station before he was placed in the local jail. While Mr. Burns was incarcerated, word spread around Cumberland that Officer Baker had been shot, and on Saturday, October 5th, Officer Baker's death was publicly pronounced by a coroner's jury. Meanwhile, Jesse Page had fled in fear after being assaulted at the scene. In the confusion, witnesses had thought he was an accomplice to a crime, when in fact he had gone to phone the police. The next morning, he would go to the station and turn himself in and be held in a cell near William Burns at the county jail. Reports indicate that Mr. Burns feared retaliation from the citizens of Cumberland. As anger rose in the white community, County Sheriff Horace Hamilton chose not to put extra guards on duty at the jail, stating that he did not fear an uprising. In most cases of racial terror lynching, lo local law enforcement failed to intervene or use force to repel lynch mobs, even when the threat of lynching was evident and underway. Despite their legal responsibility to equally protect anyone in their custody, law enforcement were often found to be ineffective in preventing or even complicit in the seizure or lynchings of black men, women, and children by abdicating their responsibilities or yielding to mob demands. That evening, Deputy Sheriff Noah Henley was the only person standing guard at the jail. Mr. Page had thankfully been cleared of any charges and released earlier that day as the mob also sought to lynch him. By midnight on October 5th, an initial group of approximately 50 white men gathered in the streets near the jail with their coats turned inside out and handkerchiefs bound over their faces. By the time the mob reached the jail, there were several hundred participants and spectators. Contemporary reports describe conflicting accounts of how the mob was able to enter the jail and abduct Mr. Burns. According to Deputy Henley, the mob stormed the jail and demanded the keys to enter, which he refused. He stated the mob then obtained a pole, which they used repeatedly in an effort to break down the door. Unsuccessful, the mob then entered and held him at gunpoint, stripped him of his clothing, his clothing, and took the keys, which they used to enter the jail. Alternatively, other informants reported that Deputy Sheriff Henley gave them the keys, which allowed them to enter the jail. Other reports claim Henley's wife convinced him to give up the keys or that the mob forcefully gained entry. After entering the jail and locating Mr. Burns, the mob beat and dragged him outside. Reports indicate that by this time, the mob had grown to approximately 2,000 active white participants and spectators. A local white attorney, Benjamin Richmond, who arrived as the mob was beginning to storm the jail, attempted to locate other officers who could intervene. Richmond later reported that after he left the jail, he managed to find one additional officer by the name of Goss. Richmond convinced Officer Goss to take him to the police station in search of more officers. Once there, they found poor four policemen with Lieutenant Schmutz among them, sitting quietly with the door locked and lights low. By the time officers returned to the jail, the mob had already dispersed. Benjamin Richmond stated that when he urged the officers to go after the mob, they moved in a rather leisurely fashion, and of course, they arrived too late. The mob had dragged Mr. Burns out of his cell, down the stairs, and outside into the street. Some members of the mob demanded Mr. Burns confess to killing Mr. Baker, but he would not. Other members of the mob were already convinced of his guilt, intent on proceeding with the lynching at approximately 12.40 a.m. on Sunday, October 6th, the mob beat Mr. Burns and shot him repeatedly, even after he had already expired. The mob intended to burn Mr. Burns' body, but Reverend William Cleveland Hicks, the rector of the Emanuel Episcopal Church, pleaded with the white mob to stop the mutilation of Mr. Burns' body. Cumberland police officers failed to arrest any of the mob participants who had participated in the lynching. After his lynching, Richmond strongly criticized the Cumberland police force, stating, the conduct of the police of Cumberland was simply shameful and disgraceful. Although the disorder was going on for more than half an hour, not one of them appeared on the scene until after the Negro was dead and would not have come then but for my action. 
Reverend Hicks also spoke out against the lynching. Delivering a sermon later in that day on Sunday that Mr. Burns was lynched, Reverend Hicks stated, last night a crime far worse was committed, committed in cold blood. The righteous anger of Thursday and Friday cast to the winds and license, vengeance and savagery were given full sway. All my friends who are responsible for these awful crimes against civilization and against God, is it that band of men alone who dragged the criminal from his cell and who fired these shots? No, it is your fault and it is mine. We must share in this disgrace. Also, we of the city have allowed the pest hole, the saloon to spring up everywhere and spring forth devilish offspring. Although officials and community members like Richmond and Reverend Hicks at the time expressed condemnation of racial terror lynchings, this outrage rarely led to meaningful outcomes in holding white mobs accountable for lynchings. On October 12th, Allegheny County Commissioners offered a reward of $500 for the arrest and conviction of any responsible for the lynching of William Burns. Despite the fact that the mob had lynched Mr. Burns, had grown to at least 2,000 people, Deputy Sheriff Henley stated he was unable to identify anyone in the crowd, some of whom, quote, seemed respectful, respectable and others who were not. Other witnesses claimed they could not remember, let alone identify those who participated. Yet there were newspaper reports that stated it is said that several of the lynchers are known and that the mob included several prominent citizens who have never known to carry revolvers, but who did so upon this occasion. Chief Judge A. Hunter Boyd, who had been on the scene urging the crowd to disperse and recognizing spectators, directed a grand jury to investigate Mr. Burns' lynching. The jury convened but returned a verdict on October 19th that no one could be identified for prosecution of the crime. The Afro-American Ledger, a Baltimore-based black-led newspaper, published an article on October 12th writing about the white mob that killed Mr. Burns, stating that without doubt, every one of them is guilty of murder in the first degree and justice will not be done until everyone implicated in it is brought before the bar and receives the penalty of his crime. This article also implicated Deputy Sheriff Henley, stating that Without doubt, the deputy sheriff should be immediately removed, for he certainly failed in his duty. If he did not connive with the lawbreakers in carrying out their deadly purpose, the idea of a man standing with a weapon in his hand, allowed by the law to use it, and then failing to protect not only the prisoners under his charge, but the property of the government of the state, the sheriff heard that there were threats being made and took no interest in the matter, save to remove himself as far from the scene as duty would allow. Mr. Burns' sister arrived from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, hoping to transport her brother's body back to Pittsburgh, but she was not able to acquire the funds to do so. On October 10th, Mr. Burns was buried at Sumner Cemetery in Cumberland, Maryland. An announcement in the local newspaper stated that the funeral would be conducted quietly. Despite the mob's lawlessness and failures of law enforcement that resulted in the lynching of William Burns, no one was ever held accountable for his death. Robert Hughes, a.k.a. William Burns, is one of at least 29 documented African-American lynchings of racial terror lynching in the state of Maryland between 1877 and 1950. The prior awareness that I had of this lynching came from connections in the local history arena and previous discussion of William Burns in the public record all seemed based on the same two or three newspaper articles circulating since. A few obvious conflicting pieces of, of important information were included. Due to the pandemic, I was working with just digital archives, mostly newspaper records. I uncovered around 50 public primary and secondary sources. While many of them duplicated information sent from Cumberland to other sources verbatim, they did occasionally have additions that may come from a contact with someone local or police notes. The initial details reported also changed some over time. For example, early on in Burn, Burns' Companion was said to be Gus Little, which was actually a misprint of Bud Little, who it turned out was not at all involved. The way I initially found to investigate these discrepancies was to order the articles by publication date and log each detail from each article. However, we needed to, the, to see this reported and conflicting facts side by side and begin constructing a story in order to attempt to discover what closest approximated fact with the keen awareness that the only one of these sources found was an Afri that only one of these sources found was an African American publication contemporary to the lynching. So I made a comprehensive color-coded timeline 
assigning each article that I had a color and font combination, I would place the details in chronological order. Then conflicting details followed one another and were more obvious, and we had an order of events that allowed the story to be communicated in the least confusing manner. All that work was necessary, but it was not the primary goal. We knew some descendants of Jesse Page's family were still local, and you will hear about them later today. With scant detail, we needed to find the descendants of William Burns' family. The details we did have were the name William Burns, his reporting of his age as 22, that he had been in Cumberland six months, that he had a mother living in Della Plain, Virginia, who he did not wish to be contacted. There were reports that a mother, aunt, or sister contacted local authorities, and eventually his sister, Selena Johnson, would come to Cumberland, hoping to return to Pittsburgh with his body, where she and his aunt lived. From Selena, we knew his mother was 42 or 45 years old and that he was 18. It seemed simple enough that I would search near the mother's home area for a family with a William Burns between the ages of 18 and 22. The closest I found was a William Burns in DC, even connected to a man named Jesse Page, but was a, I was able to determine that both of those families were connected in that locale. So I searched using what would be Selena's family name for a Selena Burns, who would marry a Johnson in Virginia. Researching Selena's husband's family also did not lead anywhere conclusive at that time. There is, however, an Afro-American Historical Association of Fauquier County, and I combed every inch of what was available online, finding no Selena and no relevant Burns family. I did, however, note the staff names there, knowing that once it was safe, this would be a place and a people we might reach to for information about families in the Della Plain area with connections to Pittsburgh and Cumberland. Being at a research brick wall and limited to digital resources, I decided to throw some money at newspapers that were behind a paywall, despite seeing that they were mostly what we already had with one or two additional mentions. Buried inside a Washington Herald article that was mostly exactly worded from a Cumberland press release, was a casual but kind of sensational statement, likely intended and placed there to put doubt on the victim's trustworthiness. This editorial comment meant to imply one thing gave us the most important information we found today. One line said something to the effect of, we don't even know if his name was William Burns. He left laundry that hadn't been picked up with the name James Hughes on the tag. If his name was William Burns and he was a transient, there are many ways he might have ended up with clothing that wasn't his, possibly. I have no idea why the name James was reported there, but thank goodness they reported any name at all and that they got the Hughes part correct. I did a search for James Hughes with no luck, but there were Hughes in Delaplain. In fact, I remembered the name from the Fauquier County website that I mentioned earlier. When I placed his sister Selena's name with the family name Hughes, I found family in the area where his mother still resided, and she, in fact, was from and had a sister still living in Pittsburgh. I researched all the children and found them all to have families or death records, except a boy of the age of William Burns by the name Robert Wormley Hughes. Robert had disappeared from all historical records. I will also say that the information I found was easy for me to research and trust the sources because Robert's family is one of the most researched Black American lineages in our country. You'll learn more of that from the descendants, but it did cause us to be careful with the sharing of the research and the telling of the story because the focus belongs on the living Hughes descendants and on the life of Robert Hughes, who, unlike his family members, did not get the opportunity to become an adult and have direct descendants of his own due to his murder and lynching by our city and county residents 114 years ago this week. Thank you. For your tireless work and research. At this time, I want to call on Commissioner David Armenti. Um, Commissioner Armenti is the chair for um, the, excuse me, leads the research committee of the Maryland Lynching um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, Commissioner, will you provide an update regarding the ongoing research and investigation into racial terror lynching in Allegheny 
soon. Yes, thank you so much. I would like to say that the, the commission's research into racial terror lynching in Allegheny County uh, and the case of Robert Hughes is, is ongoing and we don't have significant updates at this time. I, I would like to give a, a major thank you to um, Heidi, who we just heard from, as well as the many uh, coalition members in Allegheny County who really led the charge and, and uh, confirmed these various historical details. Um, just very briefly, I would want to say that this was a case that was covered nationally much more than I expected to see. In, in the course of research within the committee, we were able to find newspaper records from as far as Arizona and Seattle um, acknowledging William Burns, at least in those publications. Um, so it was, it was certainly something that was acknowledged and recognized within the overall scope of racial terror lynchings across the country, um, what was happening in Allegheny County, Maryland. Um, and furthermore, just briefly, and, and folks can find this um, within the commission website, the death certificate for uh, the gentleman listed as, as William Burns, uh, with the primary reason being listed as killed by an unknown mob, taken out of jail and lynched. So the death certificate itself officially acknowledged um, the events that occurred. But uh, with that, again, I wanna thank the Allegheny representatives for their diligent research work and, and sharing that with us as a commission. Um, and with that, I will uh, pass it back to Dr. Chavis. Thank you so much, Commissioner Armenti. Mr. Chair, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Vice Chair. So at this time, I will just explain uh, how you can submit additional testimony after today's session. So we encourage you to, uh, as was mentioned before, you can submit testimony to the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission via email at mltrc at maryland.gov. Again, that is mltrc at maryland.gov. And, and once again, we will be proceeding uh, with our session with uh, live testimony. Uh, again, if you want to submit testimony um, during the hearing, you can do so during uh, via the Zoom chat function or via the live stream via the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. Uh, again, as always, we will emphasize, please treat this moment with the respect that it deserves regarding your comments and your questions. So now I would like to recognize Ms. Glory Jackson, founder of the Brownsville Project and of the Allegheny County Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, Committee, excuse me, who will introduce two very special witnesses, the relatives and descendants of Robert Hughes and Jesse Page. Ms. Jackson is a dedicated activist and community leader who have been on it to work alongside. So I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Jackson and to thank her as I will many times uh, for her commitment and her diligence to preserving this history and helping us to bring justice. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Good morning. I am here and have the pleasure to introduce first, Ms. Renee Page, who is the direct descendant of Jesse Page. Jesse Page was present at the time of Robert Hughes' arrest and was also for a time briefly held and jailed and then was released right before the lynching. After hearing from Ms. Renee Page, we will hear from two direct descendants of Robert Hughes, Ms. Angela Davidson and Ms. Karen White, who are sisters, um, and are descendants of one of the siblings of Robert Hughes. So at this time, I will turn it over to Renee Page. Well, hello all, and thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this forum. Um, as stated, my name is Renee Page and I am a descendant of Jesse Page. Jesse Page was actually my great grandfather and by all accounts, Jesse Page was a good man. He married um, my great grandmother, uh, Gertrude. Um, they went on to have several children. Um, 
and I'm going to acknowledge them. So uh, James Page Sr., Frank Page Sr., Gertrude Lurie, uh, author, my uncle Kenneth Page, um, Josephine Mayola Page, better known as my Aunt May, William Page, Marion Page, Fisher Page, Marvin Page, and my Aunt Tiny Page, um, and of course uh, there was a Jesse Page Jr. Um, so I was in grade school when my great grandpa died. Um, I remember going to the family home and he was present, but he was somewhat distant. He didn't act, interact with us much. I remember him to be small in stature. I'm told that he regularly went to work wearing a suit. Um, we are told that he worked cleaning a local church as well as working as what my family identified as a jailer, um, meaning that he cleaned the city jail. So Jesse Page had a relationship with law enforcement through that interaction. Of course, at the age of 24, Jesse Page's life changed forever because as you heard, he was with Robert Hughes, AKA William Burns, on um, the night that Officer Baker died. If not for um, Mr. Burns stating that Jesse Page was uninvolved in the incident, um, I'm not sure I would be here today he surely saved my grandpa's life. Today, I'm imagining the terror that these young men must have felt. I'm imagining the pain that all families, all three families, senselessly endured. Jesse Page spent most of his life in fear. Clearly, this was a traumatic event which, which shaped his life. My interactions with him were brief and distant. Where I knew most of my great grandparents, I knew very little about Jesse Page. He spent much of his life being distant and inwardly hiding. He used whiskey to escape and lived by the mantra of let it be or let him be because I've had two accounts of that. Clearly not wishing to have any conflicts and who could blame him because Jesse Page surely knew how they could end. One important thing I've discovered throughout this process is how important it is to share your family's history. We have the luxury of having four and five generations walk this earth at the same time. You need to remember to share memories and stories, review pictures, pass down recipes and heirlooms and the stories that go along with them. We need to learn where our ancestors came from, what their trials and tribulations were, what did they have to overcome, what their accomplishments were, and of course, what dreams they had. It saddens me that I didn't know more about the man, Jesse Page. But what I do know is that his descendants went on to become nurses, doctors, social workers, teachers, business owners, architects, state employees, and retired servicemen and women. How ironic that every week I, a descendant of Jesse Page, walk the very ground where Robert Hughes took his last breath. It will never just be the entrance to the courthouse. It will forever be a reminder of the importance of equal justice. What I would like to see come from these hearings is for us to tell the narrative and provide information in ways that resonate with people from all walks of life. I would love to meet the descendants of the retired attorney and the pastor who attempted to intervene. Their family should know their family members were heroes. It's imperative that training be provided to law enforcement. They need support. They need supported by mental health professionals. They also need supported by the faith-based communities and community leaders. We need to find a way to build relationships of trust. 
we need programs like Operation Recess, where law enforcement interact with elementary school children during the recess time. It allows them to learn about their home lives and their challenges. And that, of course, could result in a more compassionate approach. It would also allow our young people to be able to see our law enforcement in a different light. It would see them not only in roles of leadership, but also of those who serve and protect all people. I want to thank the Commission for allowing us to tell our stories and assisting us in advancing efforts to not just the idea of equal justice under the law, but the action of equal justice under the law. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, Ms. Renee Page. We will now hear from the sisters, Karen White and Angela Davidson. Good morning. Today is October the 2nd, 2021. My name is Angela Hughes Davidson. I am the great granddaughter of Wormley H. and Georgetta Berber Hughes. Their son, Robert W. Hughes, is my great uncle and brother of my grandfather, John Henry Hughes. I grew up in rural Fauquier County, Virginia, living within 10 miles of each other with many relatives. I was blessed to know my maternal grandmother, maternal great-grandparents, and paternal grandparents, John Henry and Mary Wanza Hughes. Family stories were often a part of conversation where adults spoke and children listened. I think I was in my early teens when I learned of my grandfather's brother, Robert who was said to have gone away. I don't recall my father Lloyd speaking of him. At the time, I do remember thinking his disappearance held some sort of mystery. Our youngest brother, Timothy, often spoke to our granddaddy about the old days. Boxing and holidays are two of the subjects I know they talked about. In one of these conversations, our grandfather told Tim, that Robert was executed. Our Aunt Annie, born 1917, told me that Robert's sister and my great aunt Ethel would say that the truth never came out about his death. Thus, as an adult, I assumed Robert had been accused, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for a crime that perhaps he did or did not commit. Deeply involved in genealogy in the late 1980s, my sister Karen began looking for Robert through many resources. She found an Albemarle court records that perhaps Robert died before 1910 because he was not listed among the heirs in a settlement of the estate of his grandfather, also named Robert Hughes. Listed heirs were Robert's siblings and his mother Georgetta, who was widowed in 1901. That wasn't much of a clue, but it was something. Periodically, Karen would search for additional clues of Robert's demise, but to no avail. It was not until this past summer when Karen received a call from Chloe Jackson informing her of a lynching victim by the name of William Burns that the mystery of what happened to our Uncle Robert began to unfold. Evidence concluded that William Burns was indeed our great uncle, Robert W. Hughes. We are here today because Robert was the victim of a lynching. It has been described as horrific and yet not a lot different from other such events described and recorded in America's history. Our uncle Robert's fate was like that of far too many African-American men. The shock of the circumstances of Robert's death for another portion of America's ugly history to our family's doorstep, and it was brought with a devastating finding. The death of any 18-year-old very young man pulled at one's heartstrings. Had Robert been allowed due process, being charged and arrested, being afforded legal counsel, coming to trial with the choosing of a jury, having a jury trial, hearing from witnesses, reaching a verdict, sentencing. If guilty, serving out his sentence, if innocent, continuing to mature as a free young man, he might have lived to marry and raise a family. He might have lived a long life like his sister Ethel, 99 years old, and brother John Henry, 
my grandfather, 95 years old, had due process been afforded Robert, guilty or innocent, today's hearing would not be necessary. Today's proceedings demonstrate the desire of many in our society to acknowledge our country's history, both the great and the terrible. We must listen to families who have experienced the results of lynching and realize it tears a community's residents black and white apart. When visiting a physician, you first ask questions. Where is the pain? How long have you had it? Describe how you're feeling today. The clinician reviews your answers, performs a physical examination, and correlates your descriptions with his findings and comes up with a diagnosis. Based on the diagnosis, a treatment plan is outlined for the patient. Today, the Hughes family is one of the patients. You will be provided the location and circumstances of our 18-year-old uncle's death. We ask that you take the information and process it, removing speculation, but adhering to information proven by fact and conclude the following. Robert Hughes was denied due process. Robert Hughes was lynched by a mob. Robert Hughes was denied the dignity of our traditional African-American burial customs. Robert Hughes's family was denied the opportunity to quietly mourn his loss, but was faced with published media accounts. Robert Hughes's mother and siblings did not receive an apology or compensation in compassion for the crime committed against brother and son. Robert Hughes's descendants until 2021 were denied the truth of the events surrounding his death. We ask that today's hearing serve an example to others in this important work of truth and reconciliation, that this hearing serve as a platform that continues the healing process for this family and this community. Healing will not be instant. With continued discussions and with acknowledgement that what happened to Robert in 1907, unfortunately, is not the only recorded case in our nation's history. Only with this knowledge and acceptance of truth can our family, our community, our nation move forward in hope, knowing that all lives matter. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Karen Hughes White and I am the granddaughter of John Henry Hughes, the younger brother of Robert W. Hughes. Growing up, I spent many Sunday afternoons in the home of my grandparents, John Henry and Mary Wanza Hughes, who we refer to as Granny and Granddaddy Hughes. I knew the large charcoal pictures that hung in the hall of their home were those of my grandfather, our grandparents, of, his, of our grandfather's parents, Wormley Hughes, the preacher from Charlottesville, who met and married the school teacher Georgetta from Pittsburgh. I remember my great aunt Ethel, who my siblings and I refer to as old aunt Ethel. So not to confuse her with our father's sister Ethel. I don't recall hearing about her brother until my last years of grade school. And it was then and only then that I hear that he had gone away. I also recall hearing the name of an aunt, Selena, granddaddy's other sister, Selena, who lived in New Jersey, and that she often sent packages down to Asheville to granddaddy Hughes's children, which would be my father and his siblings. It wasn't until the mid 1980s when I became interested in our family history that I started exploring and documenting the family history. I was close to my grandparents, and I remember the night Granny Hughes died. Granddaddy called me at the nursing home. I worked there, and it was very unusual that I receive an evening call, and this one was extremely rare because it was my grandfather calling to report the death of his beloved Mamie, Mamie's dad. I often visited him throughout the weeks. Uh, and years thereafter. On one of those occasions, he told me his brother was executed. And there was a pause and I knew not to pursue additional question. I assumed 
that it was too personally painful for him. Following my grandfather's death, I did query my dad and his sisters, my aunts. My aunt Annie mentioned two white ladies riding on a trailways bus with her on one occasion and asked if she was a Hughes. This is when she was much younger. She was the one that was born in 1917. And they expressed their sorrow over the death of her uncle as the conversation went on and that the truth never came out and it didn't happen like that. We all had our suspicions and we expected something had happened uh, or something to do with possibly a white female as this happened to be the customary thing that we had seen in our community. My desire to learn the truth grew and I faithfully tried to find information regarding Robert and his father Wormley and the court process. I was successful in finding accounts of Wormley in Loudoun, Falk here and Albemarle counties and at the Library of Virginia, which validated the oral history of Wormley and the courts system. But I came up empty handed regarding Robert's death. Today, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you what we knew and what we know now about Robert W. Hughes, also known as William Burns. Robert Hughes was born at the pothouse in the village of St. Louis in Loudoun County, Virginia. His parents were Wormley H. Hughes, a Baptist minister and Georgetta Burbage, a public school teacher. Robert's father, Wormley, who was born in 1848 and died in 1909. His grandfather, Robert, who was born in 1821 and died 1895, also Baptist ministers. And a great grandfather, Wormley, who was born in 1780 and died in 1858, was born in Albemarle County, Virginia. Robert's mother was born in Pittsburgh and in the 12th Annual Report of Public Schools of Pittsburgh, 1880 to 1881, Georgia is listed as a pupil at Pittsburgh Central High School. Wormley and Witter were and Georgia married in 1885 in Washington, D.C. Robert's young siblings included his sister Selena, his twin sister Ethel May, brother John Henry, and youngest sister Sarah Myrtle. At least one of Robert's relatives and an uncle lived in Covington, Kentucky and all other relatives lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Albemarle County, Virginia. As a young boy, Robert attended church services. His mother was an organizer of the association locally in our county uh, and in Northern Virginia. She taught at three, within three different uh, school jurisdictions, Warren County, Prince William, Falk here for and Loudoun County. According to Cumberland's history, Robert arrived in Cumberland sometime in the spring of 1907. We don't know whether he visited any local churches in Cumberland or whether he, but we do know that he worked at the Alpine, Alpine Hall Hotel and served as a porter and that he worked as a driver for George Palmore, an African-American saloon owner. We know that at this time in his young age, he was no longer under the strict supervision of his widowed mother, Georgetta. To our knowledge at the age of 18 in 1907, Robert was not married and he had no children. Unfortunately, Robert was in a saloon, became rowdy, according to the accounts, and law was called to act. I won't go further into the research that has already been conducted and shared at this time. But I can say looking back in 1901, Robert's father, Wormley, suffering from overall failing health and depression was hospitalized, died, and buried on Central State Hospital grounds in Petersburg. At the time of his death, he was a watch care member at the Mount Nebo Church in Morgantown. 
Robert's mother, Georgetta, died May 15, 1921, at the home of her son, John Henry, in the community of Asheville. At her death, the family received condolences from the Methodist and Front Royal, the latest place where she was teaching. With her children, Ethel and John Henry, living in Asheville, it is most likely she was utilized at the First Asheville Baptist Church. We know she is buried on family property near Delo Plains in Fauquier County. In 1900, the entire family was living in Marshall. Wormley was 49, Georgia at a 34, Leslie, Leslie Selena, or Selena Leslie was 14, and Ethel and Robert were age 11, John 8, and Sarah 1. Ten years later in the 1910 census, John Henry was 19 and Sarah 11, and they were living in the same household in the Scott District, living with the family of William A. Jones. This was Della Plains in 1910. Georgetta is not in the home at this time. She is listed as a widower in the home of Louisa Peterson in Prince William County. We have records of Selena's marrying several uh, at different time frames. Uh, we know that she went by Selena Johnson when she, as well when she was married to Hayward Johnson and she gave birth to a William Clark Johnson who died in 19. 06 at nine months old and a stillborn female in 1908 and then giving birth to Hayward Johnson in 1911. Following the death of her husband in 1911, she married William Francis Turner and that they had one son. Those are descendants that we are not, uh, had not been in contact with. Robert's siblings died. Uh, his youngest sister died February 9, 1915, at the University of Virginia Hospital in Charlottesville. His brother, John Henry Hughes, our grandfather, died in 1986, and his twin sister, Ethel, died in, 18, in 1989 at the age of 99. And we have not uh, located a death record for Selena Johnson Turner at this point. Today, Robert still has many grandnieces and nephews. His known living nieces and nephews uh, are throughout the uh, Northern Virginia and Fauquier County areas. Um, we are appreciative for this opportunity to have time of expressing um, our thanks, our understanding and the research that has been done to bring closure to this. I have searched many years for information on my, um, great uncle. And um, out of the years of research, this has been and is the hardest one for me to handle. I thought I had it all together this morning <laughs> when I was doing this, but evidently I don't. Um, I do want to share with you that since this had first started, um, I did receive a phone call from one of our elders, first cousins, who shared the information of the best of her abilities in, in remembering uh, conversations with Granddaddy Hughes and Granny in regards to uh, his brother, Robert. Um, she says she does not wish to testify, but she remembers um, some talk that Robert may have gone away as past, passing as a person, not as a white, uh, as a white person. And that he uh, had been fooling around with a white woman and that when it became well known, well, you know what happened. I really questioned this because I wanted to know, well, did Robert resemble his twin sister? Uh, was he physically, did he have the appearance where he could have passed? And was he using the name William Burns when he first went into Cumberland? Or was this a name that 
was attached to him later? Was he living in a colored section of Cumberland? Was he living as a man of color? These are all additional questions as we try to explore oral histories. There's always more to the various stories. Um, I know Angela and I questioned this because of other oral histories on other branches of the family. So for this, we don't know, but I'm assuming that he was Robert Hughes who used the name William Burns at some point or time in Cumberland County. Um, I'm going to close at this point because I, I can't go any further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Page, Ms. Davidson, and Ms. White. Um, we are grateful and honored for sharing your stories with us and entrusting us to uh, tell the story so that people know. At this time, we are proceeding to the facilitated testimony portion of today's hearing. We will hear from individu individuals who represent the contemporaries of the different systems and organizations that were present and involved at the time of the lynching in 1907 of Robert Hughes. We have with us today, Elliot Spillers from the Equal Justice Initiative. The Equal Justice Initiative has held community remembrance projects across the nation in counties where there is record of a racial terror lynching. We will also hear from Chief of Cumberland Police, Chuck Turnett. He has served in this community for almost 30 years and is here to be a part of this healing process. We'll also hear from Tiffany Fisher, the president of the Allegheny County NAACP branch number 7007. We had also planned to hear today from Teresa McMenn, a journalist from the Cumberland Times News who has worked with the local coalition here in Allegheny County to help uncover the history of journalism in the telling and unraveling of the story of Robert Hughes. Unfortunately, because of a technical difficulty with being able to dial in, we won't be able to hear directly from her today, but she is on the line listening and covering the story. And we will make sure that she is able to provide a written testimony afterward. So at this time, I have a question for Elliot. Elliot. The Equal Justice Initiative has collaborated with communities all across the nation to memorialize victims of racial terror lynching. And most recently, you have continued to help us here in Allegheny County to have a series of remembrance projects for Robert Hughes, also known as William Burns. Now, as one of the individuals working closely with community members, can you tell us about some of the challenges and the rewards of working with local coalitions? And do you have any advice for local community organizers wishing to help restore equality and justice for their communities? Yeah, thank you, Corey. Um, and uh, I wanna also acknowledge um, the other uh, individuals and organizations representative here um, on this Zoom call. Um, Dr. Chavis, thank you. Um, for your remarks, as well as um, the entire Allegheny County um, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee, um, as well as the Maryland Lynching Memorial um, Project, um, the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, a lot of different organizations um, uh, right now in Maryland, uh, and it's just really exciting um, to be here with you all today. Um, in 2019, I remember traveling to Maryland and actually meeting with Delegate Jocelyn P. Melnick um, after um, the uh, Maryland Memorial Project Conference um, to talk about HB 307 and um, to hear more about this legislative process to get the bill passed and um, thought that it was an uh, enormous achievement when the bill did pass um, that April. Um, and have been following and, and keeping along with the coalitions, um, many of them across Maryland for the last several years. And 
Um, it's been a long time coming to get to this moment today uh, to actually hold um, this first public hearing, which is very fitting for it to actually happen within Allegheny County, Maryland, um, a community wherein we uh, memorialize uh, the lynching of at least um, uh, one um, Black child who was lynched in this community in 1907, October 1907. Um, to the question um, about reward and, and, and challenges when it comes to CRP, um, as I was thinking about and, and processing during um, Ms. Karen White's um, testimony, which um, I, I am very grateful um, and humbled to be in the presence of uh, the descendants of both Mr. Page and um, Mr. William Burns, also known as Rock Hughes. Um, as I was listening to her um, give her testimony, uh, I think it was a beautiful analogy, um, the way that she spoke about um, the, the, the process of healing and, you know, you, you use uh, going to the doctor, the doctor's visit as a way of contextualizing just what the healing process actually should look like. Um, and, and thinking about that, I thought about the body, you know, um, we all have different bodies and our body tells a story. The body is very, is, is very much so informed by the environments and also by um, the, the genetic coding um, and, the, and the DNA um, that, uh, that has been passed down and inherited um, by your family members and your loved ones. Um, and in thinking about CRP and Community Remembrance and the acronym for Community Remembrance Project um, is CRP, for those that don't know. Um, CRP is very much so like the body and that as an organization, uh, we have continuously um, worked with communities um, to examine their histories and legacies of racial terror and violence, but each community that we work with is different. Um, Allegheny County, um, which is situated in a rural uh, part of Maryland, is different from, uh, you know, a, uh, a large city like Chicago or New York. Um, and so the rubric and the measurement, the metric for success um, and, and, and the rewards um, for this community, uh, for a community is very specific to that their environment. And one of the ways, the most rewarding um, aspects of community remembrance for me um, has come from an examination of the narrative and the humanizing of the victims that we actually seek to memorialize. In this instance, um, we actually uh, had documented initially um, uh, Mr. Uh, Hughes as William Burns, um, but it was only after uh, a conversation with Chloe um, that we learned about uh, the connection that they had made with descendants. Um, of Mr. Uh, Mr. Burns, as well as Mr. Page's descendants. And that was able to allow us an opportunity to collaboratively come to uh, craft a humanizing narrative um, about the circumstances related to Mr. Burns' lynching um, and, uh, and, and update just our internal data. Um, you know, another, uh, aspect, I think, also of CRP are the challenges that um, we face. And each community faces its challenges. Um, I think that um, one of the challenges that I see most often working with communities is um, a lack of awareness um, by our coalition members sometimes about the ways in which their um, racial, gender, class, and, um, and, and, and ge geographic backgrounds and identities inform um, the structure of the coalition, but also the scope to which community remembrance uh, should and could happen locally in, in, their, in their community. Um, I'm very uh, inspired by the work of uh, this coalition, specifically in Allegheny, um, who has taken this concept of a caucus style conversation um, to actually allow their partners to have uh, 
conscientious training around the ways in which um, their race and their gender and all those other identities informs who they are in the work at hand. Um, that um, hopefully that answers a, a part of the question. Um, uh, with that, I, I pass. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, and thank you, uh, Mr. Spillers. At this time, I recognize my fellow commissioner, Simone Barrett Williams, who would like to present a question to Ms. Tiffany Fisher of the Allegheny County NAACP, on number 7007, Commissioner Barrett Williams. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Fisher. My question is as follows. The NAACP has supported the uncovering and telling the true story of Robert Hughes. How do you see his story impacting the community as we continue to learn, discuss it, it in a public forum such as this hearing? Thank you for um, your question. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to sit in this space. Um, it has already affected our community. Um, it has brought awareness to a situation within our history that has pulled us all back together um, to understand. Um, it has explained some of the relationships that we have here in our community and particularly with the black community and the police force. Um, it explains um, the divide. I often tell people that although we laws have changed, we live in a separate but equal space in Allegheny County where the black community um, holds tight to our bubble and stays close with each other and only reaches outside to the white community when necessary. And the white community only reaches into that bubble when necessary. But in this experience, as we grew, um, we were able to be examples of how bursting that bubble and being vulnerable with each other and listening to each other's oral history and truth and working um, together, we could bring true change and impact. One of the things to be mindful of is that we are in, while we are doing, dealing with this history, we are also dealing with what's going on right now. And we see across the country, um, this change in mindset of policing and what policing should be. And this change in mindset of how the history of black America and the trauma, the racial trauma that we have gone through for generation affects the racial relationships that the police officers have with us and that we have with the police officers. And that how the community responds to when someone whose skin is deeper in color um, is attacked um, is different. So we can use this history and uncovering not just the story of Robert Hughes and William Burns, but the legacy that he intentionally left behind um, in those moments and how hiding that we have created a generational curse, not just within the descendants, but within the community. Um, Miss Renee spoke about how um, Mr. Jesse Page would say, let it be, and didn't speak about this racial terror that he lived through. And to sit and think about him holding on to that for the rest of his years of his life and how that changed, how he interacted with his children and his grandchildren and a small community where we are so closely knit I wonder what a difference it would have been if Mr. Page himself would have not experienced that and what kind of um, grown or young man he would have grown into to give back to his community. Um, so learning that, we now need to unlearn those behaviors of holding that trauma inside 
Um, one of the beautiful things about the caucusing tool that I have learned is that it's okay to have safe spaces um, um, to be able to process such heavy things. And as we continue in this community to work towards um, racial healing, I hope that we can continue to work with the Brownsville Project and ACTRC and continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barrett Williams, and thank you, Ms. Fisher. At this time, I recognize uh, the Vice Chair, Dr. Charles Chavis, who will present two questions to Chief Chuck Turnett of the Cumberland Police Department. Vice Chair Chavis. Thank you, um, Chair Bakunle. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. And thank you so much, Chief, um, for joining us. At this time, I will be asking a question to Chief um, Turnit. Uh, my question is as follows, Chief. You served the local um, community as a police officer almost 30 years. What role do you think the police department can play in helping communities heal from racial trauma and assist communities as they strive to re realize justice? Thank you, Mr. Chavis. Uh, as you know, uh, policing has changed a lot since 1907. Uh, back then, officers were chosen just based on honesty and if they were big and could fight, but and they really had no training. So fast forward to present day, officers are much more educated. They go undergo immense training and the expectations of them are much, much higher. Uh, policing has been adjusted over the years. Every effort has been made to remove the biases and it's, it's worked. I think overall policing is a much better place now than it was in 1907, but we all know there's more work that definitely can be done. Uh, I'd like to mention that like, crisis management's my life. And of course, uh, I know from being my position, the August Baker and William Bourne stories. And I've often thought, uh, good thing I wasn't chief back then. I would hate to have to work through that mess, but, uh, as I sat and listened to Heidi and the others, I kind of wish I was around back then. I know that today's police officers, if they were working on that day back in 1907, there would have been a different outcome and we would not even be here today. Uh, I hope you would all agree that this is kind of an example of the advances in the policing in the past hundred or so years. So, Today, what can we as police officers do in helping communities heal from racial trauma? I know that today's discussion pertains to racial trauma primarily, and it does, but I just want to note, as many of you local participants as know, I've had these same conversations when it comes to mental health trauma in our community, addictions trauma in our community, and other crime and quality of life trauma throughout our community. So it kind of pertains to all those areas. And I also know that there's no magic answer. I uh, very much agree with Mr. Spillers and feel that uh, just like every person is unique, every community is unique. What works in one community may not work in another. Kind of like when a doctor assesses a patient on a patient basis and figures out what's wrong. I think Mr. Spillers hit it on the head where he said that each community has to be looked at differently and uh, then figure out what works there. But uh, how can police officers help in that community to promote healing? Overall, and I feel strongly about this, just being really good role models. When someone sees one of my officers, it should generate the, the image of fairness and partiality in a community. Just like when you see the uh, Liberty statue, a lady justice with the blindfold on, and that's supposed to represent fairness and impartiality, seeing a police officer should invoke those same feelings. Uh, now, we all know that occasionally officers do screw up, some intentionally and some unintentionally, and the nature of our work is tough. And when an officer does betray public's trust, it cuts deep. So, uh, uh, policing as a police leader and all police leaders, we're going to continue to do all we can 
to try to promote uh, fairness and partiality and be good role models. So the officers being above reproach are only one piece of the puzzle and bringing the community together. So this is where our other partners come into play. Here locally, I think we're doing a pretty good job in helping spread the values of fairness and partiality uh, with our uh, community partners. Uh, the, uh, we need buy-in from the community to help spread these values and we do have a lot of support. Uh, reaching out to groups and organizations is good and we do do that a lot, but working beyond those group and organizations down to the people who are not involved in those groups and organizations, that's where the work is needed, uh, going beyond those groups to the street level. And hopefully officers, police officers can help with that. We are the ones that are out there going into people's houses and going into the communities on a more individual one-on-one -on -one basis. So uh, hopefully uh, through our conduct, we can help influence people on that level and help heal the community as much as we can. Uh, I also think that uh, another important aspect is looking forward, I'm big into forward thinking. It's important to acknowledge the past mistakes, just like uh, William Burns situation. So we don't make those again, uh, but our community needs to look forward or how everything's going to be better. I, I know I, I feel better and I think you guys all do too when you think tomorrow will be a better day and there's hope. So I think if we ever try to get everybody thinking this way, it'll increase the optimism in the community and it will be contagious and help the community to heal and make it healthier. So I appreciate you taking the time to let me talk today. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Chavis, and thank you, Chief Chernet. Uh, we have received a uh, yeah a written statement, yes. um, and Ms. Corey Jackson will uh, deliver that written statement. Ms. Jackson. Thank you. So I have a prepared statement from Teresa McMenn. The question that we posed to Teresa McMinn for this panel was, what do you think journalists today can do to avoid shaping public perception as presumed guilt? And Teresa McMinn writes, journalists need to study publications by organizations, including the Equal Justice Initiative. They need to be clear in the reporting that allegations are just that and introduce that fact very early in the story and then repeatedly throughout the report. Also, Rather than simply repeating the contents of a police report, journalists can dig deeper, research evidence, and try to talk to all parties involved in alleged crimes. Journalists can also research and write about the history of the press, particularly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and its biased reporting of alleged crimes that promoted violence and led to racial, racial terror lynchings. When researching crimes of the past, particularly as reported in late 1800s to early 1900s newspapers, journalists should also recognize that reported confessions of guilt were likely either forced or fabricated by people in places of power. Journalists need to understand the pressures of an interrogation, the confusion that people being interrogated are experiencing, the terror that they're feeling and that they're likely to say whatever they think is needed to improve their immediate situation. Truth and healing across races in America begins with the formation of groups, such as the Equal Justice Initiative, the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the Allegheny County Truth and Reconciliation Commission Committee to open dialogue. Journalists can partner with organizations like these and report the work they're doing to help people in the community, including voters, understand the history that led to events such as racial terror lynchings, and how those events over time have grown racism and discrimination in society today, including everything from policymaking to education. The next question that we had was, how has your experience reporting on Robert Hughes changed the way you work? Teresa's response to this question is as follows. Reporting on the lynching of Robert Hughes has been a very powerful, emotional, and painful experience for me. It's made me think deeper about how injustices of the past have carried through and impacted the present. 
It's made me think about how the family of Robert Hughes carried the pain of his murder and yet weren't free to discuss it or later share their family history. Inconsistencies are found in numerous 1907 newspaper reports about Robert Hughes, including his name, which was reported as being William Byrne. There was little to no accountability of accuracy of reporting at that time period. Bylines were rarely, if ever, used. My experience in learning of what happened to Robert Hughes has sickened me. My research has shown that lynchings of black people, primarily black men, were a form of entertainment in many white communities. Researching racial terror lynchings has taught me to consider the bigger picture, that the murder of Robert Hughes in an event that changed the ways generations of the people have lived. It's made me search for more information, talk to more sources, and study research methods that experts such as historians in other parts of the country have found successful. For my reporting about Robert Hughes, I interviewed a doctoral student named Edwin Grimsley at the Graduate Center, the City University of New York, who also worked for many years for the Innocence Project and wrote a report titled African-American Wrongful Convictions Throughout History. He said, we can't change our current system without understanding how it was built and some of its worst functions. I think of that sentence now all the time when I'm working on various assignments. I also interviewed Margaret Van Diver in Shelby County, Tennessee. She is a researcher and retired professor of criminology and criminal justice for the University of Memphis. There is still much that we just will never know about individual cases, she said, of racial terror lynchings. Van Diver also said, collective violence, particularly when it involves the defiance of the law, like breaking into a jail or the collaboration of law enforcement officers is a breakdown of law and order. And it's a breakdown of the whole framework of justice that we have in society. Thank you, Teresa McMinn, for your written statement. When we come back to our next question that we have for the panelists, I will also read a statement on behalf of Teresa. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, and thank you, uh, Ms. McMinn. I will now uh, recognize Vice Chair Chavis. Great, great. thank you so much, um, Commissioner and Chair Fakunle. I have a question that I want to provide, raise, the concluding question to uh, Ms. Tiffany Fisher. Um, and the question is as follows. What does truth and racial healing in America look like to you? So again, thank you for the question. I think in order for us to get to truth and reconciliation and healing, we have to stop stopping at identifying who the oppressor and the oppressed are. We know that. And I think what happens is we spend so much energy trying to figure out just those two things and justify that someone is being oppressed and that someone is, being, is the oppressor that we miss the space to move forward. Once we figure out and identify who has been oppressed and who the oppressor is, the next step is for us to talk about how we move past that. Mm. And we do that with changing laws. And yes, we do that with having conversations. We also do that with creating relationships. It's important for us as African-American and Black people to have some understanding of how generational racial trauma is affecting how we respond. But is it equally, if not more important, for those who do not look like us to understand that although this may not have happened directly to us as an individual, seeing people that look like us, hearing stories about people that look like us, having the oral history passed down about people that look like us, being lynched, terrorized, and not held up in the same way within the system, changes how we see things. It creates a prejudice of a system that was built to oppress us and it creates white privilege. So to move forward, we have to own our stuff. Each player has to take accountability for where we drop the ball. Everyone has to be open and vulnerable to be honest about how their history affects how they respond to situations today. And then once we get there, we can talk about healing with each other. We can't get to the reconciliation if we haven't healed. 
we can restore, but we can't get to reconciliation. True reconciliation is when both parties understand each other and have grown past the issue and can stand together and walk into equality. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Fisher. Um, Chair Fakunla. Thank you, Vice Chair Chavis. Uh, I would now like to uh, recognize Ms. Corey Jackson. Thank you so much. So the qu same question that was posed to Tiffany, we will also pose to the rest of the panelists. And we'll start with uh, Chief Chuck Turnett next. Chief, what does truth and healing across races in America look like? Uh, thank you, Corey. Uh, so ideally, simply when bias just disappears from everybody's thought process, that would be ideal, but we know that's wishful thinking. So maybe we can get to a place where a person recognizes their personal biases and kind of acknowledges them and then ignores them and works through them so their thoughts do not interfere with their actions. Again, I, uh, I agree with Mr. Siller's uh, theory about every community is unique and that we can't uh, react to each community. Uh, strategies used to promote healing togetherness here in Cumberland may not work elsewhere and those elsewhere may not work here. Uh, in Cumberland, the first steps to truth and healing would be to identify the stress points that cause these biases, acknowledge them, and then work towards eliminating them. The big challenge is how to identify these biases and it, they may be evident in the community or they're maybe unknown. And some of these biases run very deep in our local communities. Maybe generations of families have established these negative values upon our people, their family members. So it will take participants on all levels from the, the family to the schools, pastors, community groups, government officials, including the police to help identify and educate and get people to work through these biases. Then hopefully when they get acknowledged, they can work through them and they can, uh, we can promote a healthier community. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, next, I have a prepared statement again from Teresa McMahon answering the question, what does truth and healing across races in America look like? And I will read this on Teresa McMahon's behalf. I'm Teresa McMahon, a reporter at the Cumberland Times News in Cumberland, Allegheny County, Maryland. Truth and healing across races in America looks like bringing diverse groups of people together to discuss the impact of racism in their communities. It looks like having honest conversations, no matter how difficult and painful they are. It looks like acknowledgement by white people that lynchings by white mobs against black people were real and frequent and used not as punishment for a crime, but as a method of power and control. And that vigilante lynchings were used by white audiences as a spectator sport. There must be acknowledgement by all people that those atrocious white mob crimes of the past have never gone away. They've haunted and terrorized generations of people there must be acknowledgement that systemic racism is a major problem today in this country. There must be acknowledgement that people who are new to a community or different in some way can be blocked from holding leadership positions because people in control fear that change will dwindle their power. We must acknowledge these things in order to move forward. Thank you. And finally, for this question on what does racial healing look like in America, I will pose this question to Elliot Stillers. Thank you so much, Chloe, for that question. Um, it's a great question. And um, I thought about the quote by, actually, by a scholar, activist, and poet, Sonia Sanchez. And I'll read it real quick. It says, I cannot tell the truth about anything unless I confess being a student, growing and learning something new every day. The more I learn, the clearer my view of the world becomes. I think that where we're at right now as a nation, but also collectively currently in, in Maryland is we're at this stage of truth. And if you've heard Brian Stevenson, our executive director talk um, in public before, he 
always talks about the importance of truth telling, the importance of first reckoning with the truth before we can then move into a reparative process um, that gets us towards true justice. Um, when I think about uh, our work in communities, you know, in 2015, we actually released our report called Lynching in America. And this report actually uh, talks about and contextualizes the legacy and the history of racial terror, uh, lynching and violence in America. In the report, we document at least 4,000 Black people to include uh, Mr. Robert Hughes uh, and William Burns to have uh, been lynched in the time period of 18, between 1877 and 1950. What do we know about this history? What do we know about this legacy of racial terror, lynching, and violence? We know that this time period between 1877 to 1950 must be situated first after um, the era of enslavement, a time period wherein uh, chattel slavery was, was legitimized and codified in the, American, uh, in the American consciousness. We know that we have to then uh, situate this era and legacy of racial terror and, and lynching and violence um, also after um, the era of reconstruction in America, a time period uh, that came after enslavement um, you know, informally was, uh, was, was prematurely ended. Um, and then federal troops fled the South, leaving Black people um, vulnerable to white mob violence and, and, and aggression. During the era of Reconstruction, we know that between 1865 to 1877, before this era of lynching and, lynching and, and racial terror lynchings, over 2,000 Black people were actually lynched across America. And so between 1865 to 1950, we know that over 6,500 African-American men, women, and children were lynched in communities where there were functioning court systems and functioning justice systems that did not work to protect and defend the people in those communities. What else do we know about this history? We know that during this era and the legacy of racial terror and violence between 1865 and even before that time period, um, to this time period, 1950, we know that there was a presumption of guilt and dangerousness that was assigned and characterized to, uh, to Black communities and people. We know that during this time period, lynchings were used as a tool of uh, racial and economic control to preserve and maintain white supremacy. We know that during this time period and during this legacy of racial uh, terror, violence, and lynching, that between uh, starting in the uh, time period of 1920, outdoor public spectacle lynchings began to phase out and indoor sanctioned lynchings through the usage of capital punishment actually began to pick up. In the communities where we document lynchings to have happened between the era of 1877 and 1950, these communities where we document black people to have been lynched um, most most prominently in the Deep South, primarily in Alabama, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Louisiana, the states of the former states of the Confederacy, these are states that today are that have the highest rates of executions when we think about the usage of capital punishment in our country today. Both the past and the present merge to meet us here in this entire moment. Um, and it's important for us to not denounce and to not reject the ways in which racial bias continuously, even today, informs uh, the way that we envision and examine our criminal justice system. Um, when we look at institutions in, 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 all, in our country, when you think about the media, when you think about um, education, um, these are even hospitals, these are institutions that must examine and go through a process of truth telling. They must examine the ways in which they themselves and their institutions have historically been complicit in this record um, of racial bias and terror um, that has been allowed to sustain with impunity in this country. Um, and so I think that um, what my hope and my expectation is of this uh, commission, but also of the work that we do in communities is for each of us to actually uh, 
move into a process um, of repair that gets us uh, to a moment where we can then begin to at least reimagine what true justice can look like here in our society. Again, thank you, Mr. Spillers of the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, Ms. McMahon of the Cumberland Times News, Ms. Fisher of the Allegheny County NAACP, and Chief Turnett of the Cumberland uh, Police Department. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, it is hereby accepted as a part of this hearing. Uh, at this time, we would like to transition to the final part of our hearing today, and that is the time for public comment. So at this time, I'd like to recognize my fellow commissioner, Molly Davis, who leads the Logistics Committee of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and Ms. Caroline Hahn of the Allegheny County Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, who will read the public comments submitted via email and during the course of this hearing. Commissioner Davis. Our first question comes from Donna Holly. And her question is, was Burns related to Anthony Burns, who was also from Fauquier County? Our second question is from Nicholas Creary. How can we hold institutions such as the police department and local newspapers accountable for their actions or lack thereof and their roles in perpetrating the lynching of Robert Hughes? What responsibility do these institutions have to the Cumberland African-American community today? At this time, Chair Buckley, those are the only two questions we have. So thank you once again, as well as Ms. Hahn, uh, for providing us with the public questions as well as public comments. So at this time, I would like to move that we accept uh, the testimony that we heard from our community on this day. Um, is there a second? A second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any that oppose? All right, thank you very much. The testimony from the public has been accepted. So I would like to uh, conclude this historic day with just a few thoughts. Um, first and foremost, I would like to give uh, immense gratitude and honor and praise to uh, the Allegheny County Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, as well as the descendants of Jesse Page and uh, Robert Hughes, also known as William Burns. Uh, it cannot be said enough how much we are grateful for your willingness to tell the story. Uh, we could feel the emotions. Uh, we could imagine uh, what it must have been like for Mr. Hughes at the time, as well as uh, Mr. Page. Uh, kids, uh, I know we say Mr., but they were kids having to experience that terror. I would not have been strong, I will say that now. So I, I honor them and honor their lives and the strength that they showed uh, and the bravery of Mr. Hughes to uh, essentially sacrifice his life for, for Mr. Page and, and making sure that he had the chance to do what Mr. Hughes did not live. So we thank the descendants of Mr. Page as well as Mr. Hughes for your vulnerability, your courage, um, and giving us the honor to hear those stories. So thank you. Again, I'd like to thank the Allegheny County uh, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee for all of their hard work and diligence with making sure that this story uh, has been remembered, elevated, and crystallized into the history of the state of Maryland not just the history of Cumberland, not just the history of Allegheny County, but the history of the state of Maryland. That is why we are here uh, to tell these stories and to make sure these stories are never forgotten. I would then like to thank um, my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Chavis, I can't say enough uh, about his hard work and diligence, right? Clap it up, snap, snap, snaps, anything you gotta do. Uh, I don't know how this brother has any time to do anything, let alone you know, be a husband, a father and all that stuff, as well as all the incredible work that he does uh, with his day job, you know, this is, the, you know what I mean? This is the, the public calling, but, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to him as well as, uh, I'm gonna just, I feel like I need to just go down the list right now. <laughs> like seriously, uh, Commissioner Armenti, Commissioner Davis, 
uh, Commissioner Haley, uh, Commissioner Bar uh, Barnett Williams, uh, all of you. If I don't say your name, it's not because I don't love you. You know I love y'all. Uh, I'm so glad that we have gotten to this point where we can have this moment where we can tell these stories because the first step in healing is to tell the truth. And as human beings, we know how hard it is to tell the truth sometimes. It can hurt a lot, especially when you're bringing up a story of pain and trauma. But let's also think about the triumph, the strength of Robert Hughes' family to deal with that and to make sure his story was never forgotten so that we in this position can elevate that story for all of Maryland, all of the United States, and certainly all of the world to know. So I'm grateful to you all, the public, for supporting us, supporting uh, the ACLTRC uh, with this work. We never meant to do this alone. We never wanted to do this alone. We always needed you. And we're so glad uh, that you have been here to support us. A huge shout out to Clory Jackson and all the incredible work that she has been doing while she is doing the ultimate work of creating life. I must give a shout out to that. Um, we we can't thank you enough again for being such an ardent supporter of what we are doing and what you all are doing. And I'm so glad that we've been able to collaborate and elevate each other in this work. Uh, I feel like I'm not forgetting anybody, man. <laughs> Forget it. I got everybody. Okay. Uh, so again, this is just the next step. Uh, we will have other sessions around the state of Maryland. As you see, we have some things to work out, but it's always a teachable moment. So we will continue to get better and navigate this as we navigate a once in a century pandemic. So I say that to say, stay safe. You see the mask we're on the whole time. Stay safe, stay smart. Uh, we want you to be around for all of the sessions as we navigate this state and navigate this history for the point of bringing healing and bringing justice. So I know there's reconciliation in our name as the commission. It's not about reconciliation. It's about healing. It's about justice. If we can tell the truth and acknowledge the pain and acknowledge the trauma and acknowledge the teachable moments that history provides us, we will heal and then we can move forward with justice. And that comes in the form of not just words, but actions. And I'm talking about the P word, policy, all right? Mm. Policy. So we will do our best with this opportunity that we have as a commission to make sure that we tell the story so that the descendants can heal, so that the communities can heal, that we can all heal because, yes, we are all affected by this trauma, whether you admit it or not. And then as we heal, we can move forward with justice. So with that, I thank you once again on behalf of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Again, I am Dr. David Falconley. I am honored and privileged to be in this position to help make history. You are all a part of history. Pat yourselves on the back. Thank you for being here, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Peace.